the thread is that they're all American music. I mean, that's a pretty simple answer. I mean, uh, the third part, the Baby King part, is derivative of the other two. The other two are two lines of music that develop independently from each other as the white people and the black people develop socially independently from each other. And then they cross when it comes to the uh, uh, Baby King part, which is rock and roll personified by Elvis Presley. I think the residents have the point of view that American music stopped developing as a very creative force uh, culturally and worldwide around the mid-60s. And so uh, what they show is the development of American music as they've seen it. Uh, and they weren't there really to experience uh, plain songs uh, or slave songs, but they've studied it a little bit. They know something about it, and this is what they see as the development of American music. Personally, uh, I would say it has a lot to do with the culture becoming more homogenized and the splinter groups, such as uh, the black culture, uh, the white culture that did... You, know, you, have, you have all these different cultural groups uh, that created their own music, and as uh, television in particular uh, homogenized the society more and more, you no longer had the smaller fragmented groups to create more individual music, and it's all become very sort of homogenized. Now you no longer have jazz as a form anymore. You have you know, the basic rock beat with jazz flavorings. And you, never have, you don't have country and western anymore, you don't have rhythm and blues anymore, you don't even really have rock and roll. Elvis, from the point of view of the residents and what they're doing, is an, is an icon for a certain point in American music uh, that has to do with the beginning of this period of homogenization, homogenization, or at least the beginning of it on a very broadly popular uh, point of view. I mean, if you go back and look at... Uh, swing music, some of the same stuff was actually starting to happen there. It just didn't become as broadly popular. And then World War II kind of came along and, and uh, changed everything around. Uh, if you listen to like country swing, you have country and then with a, with a swing band. So you're having two forms kind of merged together. Uh, if you listen to uh, uh, early rhythm and blues where you essentially have a big band coming into a blues situation and you're creating a form there that's like a combination of what the white people and what the black people were doing in a way uh, but, um, but still it didn't really uh, become as solid in terms of reaching out to the mass culture as rock and roll which was uh, once again, Elvis becomes the, the, the symbol for that, uh, for that you know, cross-pollinization of, of, uh, of cultures uh, that happened in America to create rock and roll. The residents did quite a bit of, of research on Elvis, and uh, they were never really particular fans of his. Uh, to begin with, they more saw him as a, as a symbol or as an icon, as I said. So, but in order to do anything about him, they had to learn about him. And in a lot of ways, I think he became a more compelling figure to them as they learned more about him. But it was more like he just happened to be a very strange, tragic victim of circumstances greatly beyond his, either his ability to see, control, or understand. And uh, this then became, uh, I think, in a lot of ways, a great paradox in his life because, on one hand, he so much wanted to be the Elvis that existed from the point of view of mythology, but down inside he realized that he was a human being like everybody else, and, and he realized the space between the human being inside there and the mythology on the outside, and I think he fell in the crack between that, those that in that space and, uh, and never really came out of it. It appeared to me that the residents' idea musically was pretty simple and straightforward. They felt that a lot of the emotional content of the songs was not really treated very deeply. I mean, if anything, a lot of the songs were treated as, as little throwaway happy pop songs when there was really a lot more deeper emotional content in those songs. And that's what they tried to do was get to the what they felt like was the true content of the song, something like 
Viva Las Vegas, you know, which Elvis really sang totally throwaway, you know, uh, gonna go to Las Vegas and, you know, have some fun and you know, all this kind of stuff. And when it's really a song about a compulsive gambler. I mean, this is a, this is a person who, who uh, you know, can't wait to get to Las Vegas, uh, not because it's like a, a fun weekend for him or something like that, because he's so compulsively driven there to lose all of his money in order to have this one great shot at, at, at making it. Uh, and that's, like I say, that's just uh, symbolic of the way that they treated all the songs. The residents, if anything, uh, are trying to take a point of view of looking at the subject of of American music and, and it, it being a changing, evolving situation from a fairly distant and hopefully objective point of view. And this is not to say that they wish to demystify as much as try to bring it into some kind of human context. But at the same time, they also respect and appreciate what's happened. So it's difficult for them not to, uh, I mean, they can't really sit back and take a, a satirical point of view of just, or a point of view of just tearing all this down without building something back up at the same time that, that shows what their real appreciation and respect for it all has been. Well, the residents give themselves an identity. They just don't particularly choose to let the public at large know what it is, or they give, they give a, an identity out for the public, and um, that's their choice. I mean, uh, what Elvis did to hide from the truth was to build walls around himself that, and then surround himself with yes-men, with people who, you know, psychophants, people that only were willing to give him, tell him exactly what he wanted to hear. And there was no way that the truth, you know, whatever it is, had a, the slightest chance of, uh, of getting into where he was. And, uh, you know, you could say that the residents do that from a public point of view, but knowing them from a private point of view, that's not what they do. I mean, they are out actually dealing with people. They're not hiding away, uh, you know, from from friends, from people that that make meaningful contact with them. You know, when they're out on tour, they're meeting and talking to people all the time. They don't uh, hide themselves away and stay in their hotel rooms and just go to the gig. And you know, that's not the way they are. To me, there's a a difference in how people treat other people in real life and how they treat them in sort of fantasy situations of their, you know, their sexuality. And I don't really see, to me, I'm having a very liberal point of view towards all that. I think anything that goes on that, that people can enjoy within the fantasy context of their own intimacy is fine. Uh, but I don't think that that should then be taken out into how someone treats someone in everyday life and, uh, and particularly in, in public. Uh, but uh, I know there are an awful lot of men who never particularly seem to, and, and women too, but I, I see it more in men than I do in women, that don't particularly, never grow out of their adolescence, really. And I think, I think Elvis was one of these people. A lot of the, oh, emotion that the residents saw underneath the surface of the music was fairly dark. I mean, you know, Teddy Bear, for one, uh, is not so much about death, but it's about a very sort of dependent, uh, sadomasochistic sex, sexuality. And um, there's a certain, particularly if you were to get into pursuing that type of sexuality well death becomes the sort of ultimate thing that you play around with with that dark side of, uh, of, of sexuality so ultimately if you're pushing that end of it you're going to be playing around with that territory to some extent although 
There was no specific idea in terms of the residents setting out to let's make, you know, a bunch of Elvis songs sound like they're about death. First off, I think there are a couple of ideas that are happening there. Uh, you sort of, I think, touched on one of them earlier on when it, the whole idea of Elvis singing love songs when he was when he was a person who was so really without love and and so little understanding of what love was all about and it's like he sang all these love songs but he sang the songs to his audience it's like the love that went on the love affair that went on in Elvis's life really had much more to do with uh, him and his audience and when he sang love me tender he's singing to his audience he's telling them to love me tender love me true and um, so uh, I think all the the pleading that gets into the song about uh, you know wanting his audience to love him and then uh, then what happens is you have the uh, the the Rolling Stones and the Beatles uh, samples coming back and and what this is is the uh, American music you know, coming back, it's the, you know, the British invasion, as they called it in America, uh, taking his audience away from him. And really, after that happened, uh, I mean, you, you know, you can talk about the, the square stuff of earlier, you know, Elvis was square. I mean, nobody, nobody saw Elvis as particularly being hip anymore after the whole Beatles thing, uh, which once again was, was bringing American music back to America by foreigners, really, and uh, and so once again, the whole I idea of that is uh, is him pleading with his fans to continue to love him as he's essentially being uh, killed uh, by the music, you know, coming from somewhere else. <laughs> 